And finally, I asked to with my friend, let's go, get out so. I made the red band. Looks like a communist and a special mission. Many people lined up to wait in the ferry. I asked who in the charge of here. Somebody the North Korean communist. So I told him, very low voice, we are special mission to South. That's why we get the boat, cross the river, and we the bend out. Let's go, to, we are now free. Cap Chong Chi joins tens of thousands of others fleeing the communists. Within days, the North Koreans bridge the Han River and continue south, pushing back the remnants of the South Korean army. It's now clear that South Korea will cease to exist unless someone comes to their assistance and comes quickly. They were driving on the main highway just north of Seoul, and in this position, the communists are just about a kilometer on the other side of the river. And this area is critical to any advance that the communists would want to make, so there are a large number of tank obstacles located on the highway. And the overpass we're coming up to is one of those tank obstacles. It looks like a commercial sign and a regular overpass, but it's not. It's actually huge slabs of concrete suspended above three columns. And what would happen is in an emergency situation, they would blow the columns and these large slabs of concrete would come down and provide an obstacle for any communist armor. After the capture of Seoul in June 1950, communist troops led by T-34 tanks moved south, crushing all opposition. The situation deteriorates so quickly, the UN is forced to act. It realizes if it does not get troops on the ground immediately, South Korea will be lost. Throughout July, thousands of Americans arrive in Korea and are quickly thrown into battle. But their numbers are insufficient to stem the momentum of the communist advance. By early August, the Americans and South Koreans are beaten back and on the verge of defeat. They will make their final stand defending a small corner of Korea known as the Pusan Perimeter. This is the Naktong River, and in the summer of 1950, it was the western wall that was known as the Pusan Perimeter. Pusan Perimeter was all that was left of South Korea, and the North Koreans had every intention of crushing that position. On the west side of this bridge were the North Koreans, and on the east side were the ROC Army. And they would face off in one of the most decisive battles of the war. We're very fortunate to have found Mr. Kim. He served with the 1st ROC Division, which is the Republic of Korean Army, in 1950, and he fought at the 38th Parallel, and he fought here on the Nakong River. The 
North Koreans attacked with superior numbers of tanks and men. But after weeks of fighting, they still cannot crack the UN line. This incredible defense is assisted in large part by the Americans' complete domination of the air. Each communist attack is punished by devastating airstrikes of napalm and high explosive. <laughs> On September 15, 1950, the Americans deliver a decisive blow with the landing of 70,000 Marines at Incheon. Over the next six weeks, the UN destroys the North Korean army and advances towards the Chinese border. But just when complete victory is in sight, the tide of war once again turns. On November 26, 1950, 200,000 Chinese communist troops attack the UN forces and catch them by complete surprise. Within days, the UN forces are in full retreat. The communists inflict terrible casualties on the UN forces and drive them back 200 miles into South Korea. The question of how to deal with the Chinese intervention, whether to strike at targets in China or even use nuclear weapons, paralyzes the American government. The world stands on the brink of total war. It is during this desperate period the first Canadian troops arrive in Korea. We're on a Korean Navy patrol boat just off the port of Busan, or Pusan, as it was called during the Korean War. Today, you can see it's a very busy port in a city of about four million people, but that's not the way it was during the Korean War. Busan was the port of entry for most Canadians arriving from Japan. It's about a 200 kilometer trip across the sea. And of course, as the men arrived, they would go by the exotic islands, the fishing boats, and see that this was truly a strange land. Miles off the coast of Korea, barely able to see land, we smelled it. Night soil used on rice paddies was one of the ingredients. I suppose plain old garbage from the Port of Busan contributed to the odor. Someone on deck remarked that if the world needed an enema, they would no doubt insert the tube here. Hours later, we docked in Busan. So this is Korea. The first group to come over were the second Patricias. And when they arrived, they were met at the port and quickly put into trucks and taken out into hills for training because they were about to participate in the upcoming United Nations offensive against the communists. The second battalion, PPCLI, is fortunate to have an experienced commanding officer, a highly decorated Second World War veteran, Lieutenant Colonel Jim Stone. Stone puts his men through six weeks of rigorous training, hoping it will be enough to prepare them for the tough fighting ahead in difficult terrain and against an unknown enemy. There seems to be a whole pile of, you know, of false peaks. Yeah, yeah. I know where we crossed the valley floor, it wasn't very wide. We are traveling through central Korea, trying to find the route the Canadians took on their way to join the UN offensive in early 1951. With me is Dave Crook, who has returned to this part of Korea for the first time to try and retrace the steps he took as a 19-year-old private with the 2nd Battalion, Princess Patricius. What we're going to do now is we're going to try to find the village called Chomni, and really Chomni is the jump-off point for the Canadians in the Korean War. Mm -hmm. 